Alright, uh, let me try it. Goedemiddag. <laughs> so, uh, everyone has a superhero, right? Batman, right? Or Superman, right? Be true, we also have a superhero. Last July, when we launched ourselves, we decided to adopt SRP as a best currency. Then when we were onboarding SRP, there was some issue with what we were configuring the password from the bit. So, and then last July, I was traveling, I was on Bitcoin in Asia, and in the middle of the night, I received a call from Ripple. Someone from Ripple called me that, look, curious, you got to drop on this right away. There is some big issue with your SRP thing. So we have Hugo in the back, in the back, try to reach out to us, try to reach out to SRP report, and then ask them to inform us right away. We need to have on these prices. And then there's a superhero. Uh, he worked almost you know, all night, and then you know uh, I heard he someone had a fight with his wife, with his wife as well, because we is pretty much occupied with the uh, seven us on the ass. Uh, so. Uh, let me introduce this thing. Hi, everybody. I'm going to redirect this applause to you going in the back, by the way, because, man, you gave up a lot of time and effort to help you guys. Yeah. And uh, I, I believe about 100 other exchanges that were tested. Yeah. Thank you. He, I think he called 40 exchanges from all over the world like a year back. Yeah, my crazy. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, uh, welcome everybody on behalf of uh, Petru. Thank you for having us here. Thank you for you and uh, your team to travel from all over the world to yeah. actually get there. Why yeah. answer them? So we love it. We love to. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and I, I assure you will enjoy it. Have a good and we'll enjoy it. So, um, you guys know me as the guy from Twitter with Parrot and uh, XRP Labs. There's Ali. And then there's uh, Tristan, he's playing soccer today, so he's not here. Um, and I was asked by the Bitroom team to uh, like share a little bit of information, a little bit more than I shared in the past about what we're actually building to uh, yeah, help you support uh, the XRPL ecosystem and help you to actually use the XRPL for more than just speculation, right? So, um, what we're actually building, there are three projects we're working on. One is already as good as finished by Ali, but we're waiting with the release until uh, the main project goes live. And uh, the main project uh, will be called Sign, and the clicker works. Amen. So, what it will be is a signing platform. And um, I will explain a little bit more to most users. At first glance, it will look like a wallet app. But there are many wallet apps already, and they all do the same thing. They look really awfully crypto wallet geeky, and they allow you to keep funds. And we're not building Sign the signing app, we're, bu we're building Sign the signing platform. And we like to build this one thing, this one platform where end users and developers and beneficiaries can meet. And I will try to explain a little bit more about it just right here today. It's the first time I actually share this information. And I think you will be the first people to actually know what we're building the past months and for the past few months as well. So, for the end users, uh, Sign will deliver um, like a user experience we know as online banking, not as crypto. So, what it will allow you to do is, of course, check your balance, send your funds, any currency, because the XRP ledger can handle any given currency issued at the XRP ledger, and in a later stage also for IOB. So, we're not building a crypto wallet. Yeah, so we're not building a crypto wallet, we're building a banking app, except without a bank. We're building a banking app based on a digital ledger, based on the XRP ledger, and based on ILP. So it's not for geeks. We know crypto wallets are for geeks, and then 
like somewhere near the bull run and 2017, suddenly 10% of the population here had a crypto wallet or multiple crypto wallets on their apps. But it was, it was still, I mean, a few percent of the population, and most of them geeks, were building something that my mother could use, and maybe even would want to use. And we're not building like a crypto wallet to hold your crypto tokens, we're building a banking app that holds your euros, your dollars, your XRP, whatever uh, currency. Of course, there's a big discussion, is it the asset or a currency? I think it's currencies. If it's, if it's a banking app and you can spend it as you can spend your euros, um, I think it's, it's, it's actual currencies. You can start paying with that. And it's not uh, family seed mnemonic, keep your shit safe, otherwise all your funds will be gone thing. Of course, you still have to do this, but we're going to help users get started with a really secure, user-friendly setup uh, guide in app. And there's no way you can, uh, pardon my French, fuck this up. There's no way. We're going to make it really easy. And then, uh, we're not going to work with long account addresses. I mean, ever transferred money to Bitru or another exchange or maybe a friend. It's uh, depending on the currency, of course, big X or R and then a lot of characters. And it's really hard to use this for regular payments. Um, well, I mean, anytime you want to pay, you know who the other party is, right? You know that it's the exchange you're going to send them. You know it's your friend, you know it's your mother, you know it's... So you always have some kind of relationship with the beneficiary of the funds. So why scan a QR code and check like uh, uh, our address this long, 26 characters? It doesn't make sense. Easy to make mistakes. Not going to do that. We're going to add a directory, an uh, account directory. We're going to add lookup features and social features. If someone is near you and you want to pay for beer, I mean, we'll just show the people around you. If you want to send money to someone you already know, the person is probably already in your address book because the person already trusted you with their phone number or email address. We don't want to store those email addresses, but we can sure make we can make sure you can find each other, right? And of course, like a directory with trusted addresses. If you want to deposit to Bitru, we know the hot wallet of Bitru. We know the hot wallet of Gate of Bitru. We know their hot wallet. So let's say. If you want to find them, we can confirm it's them. It makes it much easier to actually start using payments. And then, really important, crypto wallets today are only push. You, as a user, are going to initiate the transfer of funds, right? You're going to, you say, I want to deposit like a K, 1K XRP. So I'm going to enter the destination, I'm going to enter my destination tag, I'm going to enter the amount. Easy to make mistakes in the destination tags. Whoever made a mistake with destination tags, one, two, three, and four. Once you get started, people are okay. Even I made a mistake with a destination tag once. <coughs> it's just really easy to make a mistake. And um, if you look at everyday payments, and even like uh, settling an amount between friends, it's probably not push. It's probably pull and requests. I'm in a store. I want to pay. I'm not going to pay this amount to that store. The store says, thank you for buying my stuff. Give to me this amount. And I don't care who me is. It's the store. I pay the store. I don't care about a big wallet address or whatever. So I'm just going to accept payment request. So for developers, it's a nice, I mean, when, when we're talking about payment requests, we're talking about developers, of course. Developers and beneficiaries. Of course, the beneficiaries will have a developer build stuff for them to make it really easy. So um, what we're going to do is not just build an app, we're going to build a platform. And what we're going to do with this platform is we're going to focus on sign requests. It's not you that's going to send something and sign it, it's a request that you're going to approve or deny it. Anyone here ever looked at uh, XRPL or any crypto transaction? Like, what does a transaction look like from the perspective of a developer? Anyone? Uh, yeah, of course you will. <laughs> yeah. yeah? Uh, 
uh, let me show uh, what it looks like on the XRP layer. So, this is a transaction before signing on the XRP layer. Normally, I would say it's a transaction type payment. I mean, there are other transaction types on the XRP ledger, but in this case, we're going for a payment, it's the most common type. And we're going to send it to an account, the big R address, in this case, it's the Tibbot Hot Wallet. Uh, and I'm going to specify a fee of 10 drops. Of course, everybody talks about 12, but 10 works as well. Um, there's, a, <laughs> there's a destination, and there's a destination tag. And there's an amount, it's in drops, so we remove six zeros, it's actually 10 XRP. There are flags, who knows what are the flags, but I'm sure there are certain scenarios where you definitely want them in place. And uh, we're uh, saying this transaction is only valid until this ledger sequence, so there's maybe 10 ledgers from now, so with a ledger closing time of 4 seconds, in 40 seconds the transaction will expire, so either the transaction will be included in a block, and I'm really certain 40 seconds from now it went through, or I'm really certain that it will never go through again or anymore. And there's a sequence, it's your account sequence. Every time I'm making a payment or a transaction on my source account, it will increment with one and it prevents double spending. So this is like a simple transaction. I'm sending 10 XRP to the table from my, from, uh, uh, oh no, actually it's a withdrawal from the table to my, it doesn't matter. I own the private key to sign for this account and I send it to Ripple D, to the XRP ledger. So what will happen is this transaction will be validated and validators will vote if it's okay, we'll order it, it will be in, in four seconds, right? So it will be applied to the XRP ledger and I transfer the money. But there's a problem with this. As I just explained, the end user, the sender, only knows a few parts of this transaction. So the end user knows their own account address. Of course, it's like a bank account. I mean, you know your own bank account number. And they have their private key. They can sign it. They don't know the amount, maybe they, but they probably, if you're in a store, you'll have to enter it at least. The store knows the exact amount because they just scanned your products. You don't know the amount, you don't know the destination, you don't know the destination tag. That's something the store or the exchange or whoever has to give to you. You have to enter it, scan a QR, make mistakes, etc. So then, uh, this is the end user. Then there's the developer. And the developer doesn't know the source account because they want you to pay something. And maybe you have three XRPL accounts, like your, your, re your, your regular payments account, you have a savings account, maybe you have a joint account with your wife, save it for later. They don't have the private key of the person that's going to pay. They may ask for it, but you should never give it, and they should never ask for it, because you don't want to be in possession of someone's key. It's a big risk, you don't want to take it. But they do know where they want you to send, which amount of money, right? So that's what we're going to solve. We're going to build this platform with an app on top that's going to connect the developer and or beneficiary of the transaction with the end user. So the developer can just send a transaction template to sign to the platform and the end user will receive uh, either a push notification or a QR code to scan and pair the first time and the end user can say, okay, I want to pay from this account. I'm going to sign it and I'm sending it back to the platform. And it's going to hit the XRP ledger. And four, within four seconds later, we are actively going to notify the developer that the transaction has been signed and went through. So this is a template that the developer would send to us. They would send, uh, I don't know the account, I don't know the fee, because maybe it's busy. They don't know when the end user is going to sign it. Maybe there's a higher fee. The user knows when they're going to sign it, because that's when they're actually opening the app and they're clicking accept or deny. Uh, and we're going to take a fee that will make the transaction go through at that moment. The end user knows the flags, last ledger sequence, and account sequence. They're going to send it to the sign platform, and the sign platform will turn it into either a QR code or a push note. We don't want any developer in the world, because it's got it's to be an open platform, right? Everybody's going to be able to integrate with it. We don't want any random developer to be able to just push messages to our platform and spam users with push notifications. 
So actually, the first time you're going to interact, interact with a specific developer, a specific platform, a specific exchange, a specific store, first time, you're going to see a QR code. You're going to scan a QR code with the sign app, and it's going to show you the transaction. Like, here's the transaction, it's this amount, to that party. It will probably show the logo if we know it, so, I mean, you can trust the transaction, you can trust the destination. And then, if it's the first transaction, you are able to check a box and say, I want to trust this platform, I want to trust this destination. Meaning from that moment on, only that platform will be able to send transactions with a push message to your device. Really funny, I just took a picture of this hashtag. Uh, uh, yeah, power. it's a real one. It will show you actually open Xing Atkins power. Yeah. That's really funny. Yeah. We're working on something. <laughs> we haven't been sitting there in the office watching sheep drinking beer. We're actually building something. So, what does this look, this sign request for the end user, right? This was the developer. I, I, it's a nice one. How many people are actually developing something, have developed something, are building something, are planning to build something? One, two, you, three, yeah. four. <laughs> Okay, so a few people here, so it was interesting at least for a few people. <laughs> so now for the end user, right? This is what it's going to look like in the first place, a sign request. Either you scan a QR code for the first time, or you're just accidentally opening the app and you will see uh, in your inbox a new event, like there's a new transaction for you to sign. Tinder style, right? Swipe right, sign in, swipe in. <laughs> and or it can be a push notification. And the right screen, of course, push notification will only happen if you trusted that platform, that destination, at least one time before. So, of course, the push notification is the most user-friendly way because you'll be in a store and the store will say, hey, I know you, you've got to pay, push notification, tap it. So it's just in the platform that will send it. Exactly. You, you, I mean, you trust. Not even the platform, I mean, you, you trust the platform enough to allow push notifications, but the platform will still not be able to sign the message, to sign the transaction. If there's still interaction, you still got to review it. Because, so you open the push message or you scan the QR code, right? Next step, you review the transaction. So this is what's, what it's going to look like. Can I ask a question? Yeah. What happened to you? Sorry, I'm going to name my name since you grew up in this territory. I mean, sorry. Um, what, about, what I always used to do is regulation and you, know, you talked about a banking app. Yeah, it looks, it feels so, like a banking app. Yeah, so regulation will come in so you can go to yeah. But Start. here's the thing, we are at no point in time we're in possession or even enabled to touch your funds. You are entering your account secret in your own device, in your own phone, mm -hmm. and we're just a messaging platform. It, a lot of banks are like that as well. They're messaging yeah. platforms. Okay, yeah. in terms of terminology, yeah. like Wizard Suite or the latest yeah. system, or whatever we're talking about, you know, in order to be free or whatever. Now, the thing is, with obviously banks and their licenses, in terms yeah. of being bank, you know, to yeah. the proper licensing authorities, and also they need custody agreements. Yeah. But so it's not the stuff it is. It's your own account. I understand that. The regulation will come. I know. Regardless. I hope so I have. This really I hope I have some more time. Can I speak to you yeah. about your How does regulation fit in with what you're doing now? Yeah. Eventually, the regulation will come because they know how to do it. Yeah. And apps like this will be great. Yeah. So what I'm going to do is I, I'm going to finish this talk. Right. And I hope I have some time left, and I'll definitely get back to you. Yes, yeah, because you. we're. I mean, while we're building this, there's a big chunk of my time going into. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. So, uh, you're going to review the transaction as an end user. So you will see the uh, application or platform that actually requested you to sign something. A little bit of trust there. Um, and you're going to see the transaction type. As I mentioned, the XRP ledger allows you to send more than just payments. So maybe you want to send an offer, but I mean, let's go for a payment. You are sending a certain amount of XRP to a certain destination. You are sending a certain amount of XRP. In this case, we don't know the destination. We'll show the R address. But maybe you add it to your address book, and next time we will be able to 
give you information. And you're going to accept the transaction. So you want to sign it. You're going to select that account you want to sign it with. As I said, you will probably, and I hope uh, you will, because uh, you're probably going to select the source account. So, let's say I have my cool wallet, and I only store like a maximum of 1000 XRP in this account. That's a lot of money, but I mean it's not that much. It's not that I, I'm not bankrupt if someone steals that. Of course, we want to do everything to prevent someone from stealing that. But let's say my pool of wallet has a maximum of 1000 XRP. And then when the balance gets lower, I will just use my savings account to top up my uh, hot wallet. I don't need that much of security for my hot wallet. I want my account to be secure, but I want to be able to pay really easily in the store as well. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to protect it with like face ID or a thumbprint. What my savings account, there's my money, there's my, my worth. So that's what I'm going to protect with a real good secret. But it's not usable for everyday payments. When I'm in the store, I'm not going to type like a 20 character password like my last holiday was in France and I loved it. Exclamation mark. So, <laughs> except I didn't go to France. So. <laughs> so, I'm going to select the account and I'm going to sign it. And I'm going to use whatever I set up to be secure enough for my account. We wait maximum of four seconds. And now the developer or beneficiary is going to receive a webhook, meaning they did nothing. The whole time you were doing this, they just waited. They didn't have to pull the XRP letter. Is the transaction coming through? Is the transaction there? Is the transaction there? Still not there. They just receive an active notification from our platform to their platform. And they know you paid or you didn't. So they can already they already know what to say when they when when you return to their platform like right? uh, hey, thanks for depositing, or hey, why not? So, and the end user is just going to return to the application or web app they left uh, when they saw the signing request in the first place. So, what we're hoping to do actually is deliver an awesome user experience. You keep your secrets, we don't want to have them, but we definitely don't want you to share them with other developers ever again. We're going to make it really easy for developers to actually meet users on the XRP ledger or IOP. And if I'm talking about IOP, I mean the XRP ledger is really suited for like one-time payments. Or I mean there's escrows and other things, but if you want to pay a large sum, you maybe in a store or to a friend, you just do a one-time payment to another party. If I'm talking IOP, next stage, but it's going to be really interesting for a lot of other use cases. We are probably all familiar with the streaming payments on IOP. Uh, it's what Coil, Coil uses for donations, stuff like that. But uh, that's, that's a lower amounts of value, but uh, maybe during a longer amount of period of time, streaming. But think about daily use, like, like daily life use cases. I mean, I'm, I've parked my car here, so it's crazy expensive. It's horrible. But uh, maybe I want to pay for the parking uh, using IOP, the streaming payments, the payments will stop when I pick up my car. No need to go to the stand in line for whatever machine to pay for my parking ticket. Uh, subscriptions, all kinds of things. We're going, going to make it really easy in that as well. So you just scan the QR code, you say start, the QR code contains the destination and the amount of value per uh, time interval and you'll just pay for your parking. We're actually working right now to, uh, with one of the largest vendors uh, for the hardware and parking garages in Europe. Uh, so that's a really nice possible launching partner. Uh, so that's it, yeah. But I'm also planning to use other businesses. I can imagine like using my phone provider, which is like 40 per month. Yeah. And to get built automatically through one platform. Yeah. This is going to be possible for work. That's definitely going to be possible. Yeah, I mean, we were, we were building one platform and an app for the end user, a platform for end user and developer app for end user, uh, where they can actually meet and start the exchange of value. But are you going to approach uh, like businesses yourself, or are the businesses going to come to you because it's I, useful? 
what, what, what happened today is that actually the businesses approached us. So that's really interesting. And if at some point this uh, is going to increase, I think I will look for partnerships or people who are actually going to do this because I like to develop most of all. So I would just love to be part of a small developer team uh, and continue building this stuff and thinking about this stuff. Um, and then maybe have other parties do commercial activities. But what's, I, I, don't, I honestly don't know if this is what they're um, moving towards. But if you look at the open positions at Spring from BioRipple today, they are also looking for people that are actually reaching out to the communities, doing some kind of like maybe partner commercial activity. So I, I, I hope there will be, at some point, there will be like Spring or an independent initiative uh, that will try to match all the uh, businesses that are now building stuff, probably with funding by Spring, with actual use cases and businesses that may benefit from implementing this. But what's interesting is that the, part, the parties we're talking to today are they reach out to us. So there's some interest there in more efficient ways. And is it more likely to be, I suppose, initially, like, using the stove, I'm assuming this is online, so So there is some interest there in more efficient things. And is it more likely to be, I suppose, initially, like, you keep using the word store, but I'm, I'm assuming this is online stores rather than your, well, your McDonald's or your... It, there's another interesting thing. Like, we're talking uh, mainly to two possible partners right now. One is uh, specialized in parking access payments throughout Europe. And the other party we're talking with um, is the provider of point of sale systems to 200,000 restaurants in Europe. Because okay. I was thinking, you know, like people like Janico and yeah. all the things. Mm -hmm. It goes from the point of sale to yeah. them, and then you're adding a further delay to go from them to X. Yeah, but that's online, you simply put that in a shopping cart yeah. and you're done. Right? I think online uh, may work, then again, there's already all kinds of APIs we can build in browsers that support ILP today, so I think that will take care of itself. Okay. If you look at retail payments, especially in multi currency environments, and if you look at, I mean, the Netherlands is pretty organized when it comes to payments. There's only debit cards and low fees. There are a lot of countries that still use credit cards, pretty high fees. Mm -hmm. And a lot of stores use point of sale systems. But they don't all develop their own point of sale systems. There are maybe 20 to 50 uh, smaller and bigger point of sales vendors. Uh, so if you get this implementation into their software, it's maybe 20 to 50 partnerships and you cover Europe. Or, or the world. So we definitely don't want to go for the integration on a per store basis, but I think it's really interesting to talk to the point of sale guys. And actually one of the uh, like payment provider hardware line guys today uh, wants to sit in at the meeting I'm having with the point of sales guys uh, next month. So they're interested as well. There's, I mean, you never know what's going to happen, but they're, at least they're open to exploring alternatives or looking at the, the whatever may become the competition or whatever. And yeah, it's just interesting to know that what part of the chain yeah. you yeah. think it's easy to get into. Yeah. Yeah. Also, why would they want to give up to these point of sales people when they're making all the money from it? Why would they want to do that? Point of sales guys aren't making it. They, they like, are. For example, saying something like Elisa, for example. Well, the point of sales, actually, the party we're talking to is a company that does uh, like a complete outsourcing of administrative stuff for restaurants. Right. So they don't only get the point of sales solution into the restaurants, they also manage the energy contract, the phone contract, the internet contract, the Wi Fi for the customers. So it's a package deal. You just, you're a restaurant, you just knock on their door, they will say you will pay this month and we will take care of everything. And they're a point of sales vendor independent. They just get the best solution yeah, to the restaurant. Yeah, dealing with the demand side, not the supply side. Yes, and, okay, and, and what's actually interesting, this company um, doesn't really get paid this, that much for, delivery, for getting the contracts into the restaurants because the money is flowing to like the energy company or the internet company. They are being paid a percentage of the savings yeah. from the restaurants because they have a package deal. 
so they can save more money for the restaurants if they can lower the transaction fees. And if they get a chunk out of that, it's really interesting for them to get some of these point of sales vendors to implement this, save money, and take a chunk of the save money. It's quite clever. <laughs> <laughs> so, users don't have to enter all kinds of info when they're making a payment, and this is really important, the users don't have to trust the developer or an external device with your secret ever again, but they got to trust their device. I mean, if your device is compromised, you're screwed. So we're adding all kinds of things into the app as well. I mean, the app won't run if your device is rooted or jailbreak, stuff like that. We don't want you to make that mistake. So, up next, I, I'm talking exactly 30 minutes. I don't know. How <laughs> that. I don't know. Uh, please say so if I already spent my time. Do I have a few more minutes? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Let me get back to the licensing question. <laughs> so I know. Right now we will get away with building this, saying, hey, we're just developers, we're just building a platform, right? But, I mean, uh, January next year, AML5, Europe, so new AML regulation, uh, still focusing on payments, also crypto payments. So, probably, especially in the Netherlands, we're also lagging, we're lagging a bit. We will be able to get away with this, hey, we're just developers for maybe a little longer, but I know, of course, at some yeah, point... Yeah, right. No, no. But Europe, I mean, I, I can I write. I mean, I can read about the line. Can write a book about. Yeah, yeah. I mean, but um, really yeah. Europe and, and especially the Netherlands right now, they say just oh, I don't know, crypto. Mm, just, okay. You know, you starting to smell and look like a bank. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? And yeah, it's yeah, so good question. Like, uh, you can yeah. like, basically would accept it. I know. So we gotta we gotta do something, right? So we started to do something while we are developing. Um, I'm spending. About two hours every day for months now on the regulation and licensing part. And um, I've told, told to Spring about this as well. They know that we're doing this. I mean, um, at some point, rather sooner than later, we're going to uh, start, we, we will have to start a regulated business. Maybe even call it a bank. Well, why don't you call it so Yeah. Oh, I've seen this idea. Exactly. So, so, so what? What we're doing, is, it's two stages actually. First, we want to get the crypto licenses because that's the easier part. I mean, starting a bank, that's really difficult. Mm -hmm. Not undoable, but I think, I mean, it's hard. It will be hard. It will become hard. It will cost us a lot of time and it will be a many men job. Man um, so, we're starting with the crypto licenses. And if you look in Europe, the, uh, actually, one of the first countries that had their ducks in a row when it comes to crypto licenses is Estonia. And even Estonia is now changing the rules. They're getting more strict, they know what's coming. So maybe a year ago, if you applied for a crypto license, they didn't even have to see you. It's just online application, you get a stamp, like approval, digital stamp, everything's digital in Estonia, it's amazing. Uh, so a uh, government signed digital document, you will have your license and then maybe sometime after that, they will ask you a question like, hey, can you give me some reports? Or maybe if you find something unusual, you will report it to them. They're changing it. So we started with an application. We, fought, we uh, started a business in Estonia. Uh, so XRPL Labs is a company in Estonia today. Uh, but that's more for us, for our activities. There's another company founded, it's IOV, Internet of Value Labs in Estonia. We're, uh, we applied for licenses. And I've been to Estonia two weeks, three weeks back, or was it? To actually have an interview with the financial intelligence unit about uh, what, what we want to do and how we're going to do it. So uh, now there's this whole difficult thing about a criminal record. I don't have a criminal record, but I will have to show them that I have a blank criminal record. And then uh, um, I found out a few weeks back that the Dutch government is the only government in Europe that doesn't give a clean <laughs> criminal record. You can go to The Hague or any other court, there's one in Amersfoort, my hometown, you can view your own empty criminal record, you cannot make pictures, and you cannot get a copy. <laughs> so there I was, in Estonia, in the police station of Tallinn, 
And I said, I can only view it. You can come with me, but I can <laughs> give it to you or show it to you. And I thought this was really fishy, yeah. except they already encountered this a few times. And actually, all the Dutch applicants, there are about 15 applicants that are from the Netherlands that applied for a crypto license in Estonia, and they got all rejected because of this one stupid rule of the Dutch government. <laughs> And I think I found a way around it, so maybe one week. Germany. Yeah. <laughs> so I'll actually have to move there and become a citizen of Germany. I mean, I'm an East citizen of Estonia, not, not, not good enough. I mean, I'm a Dutch citizen, Dutch rules uh, I think I found a way, thanks to a woman in the Justice Department in the Netherlands, she will get a cake if this gets through. I'll know soon enough. So then we have a crypto license, and they allow us to do two things. They allow us to hold Estonian crypto for users. So now we're getting there. Now, I mean, of course, we got to put all this uh, regulation into effect. We've got to monitor transactions, working on that as well. Um, but now we can hold Estonian funds, and we can even do more than I just showed you. We can hold your funds. Uh, so again, and like do a prepaid ILP wallet, your phone can be turned off and your parking meter still runs. It's interesting. Yeah. Why, don't you, um, excuse me, why don't you just be, why don't Ripple in the US just get a banking license? I because don't know. Because with no respect, you know, Estonia is a lightweight. It's not yeah. a tier 7 country. I know. You know, if I'm from the UK or Australia or whatever, block, funds are blocked. Yeah. Going to Estonia because yeah. it's like an Eastern European country. We don't know much about it. It's a real issue. Yeah. Um, there's not a lot of security. You know, if we see a Russian developer in Estonia and whatever, the major banks in Australia, which so there's four of them, and they're the most profitable banks in the world, will block those transactions. Yeah. But it's, and it's they're very closely aligned, obviously, with the regulation out of the US and the regulation yeah. out of the uh, UK and Japan. But there's this is just crypto, this is not fiat. I know, but you know, we're talking about custodian yeah. issues, regulatory issues, and banking yeah. issues, and banking licenses. Yeah. And seriously, it's just not going to cut I don't know if, uh, I mean, I cannot answer this question on behalf of Ripple. Yeah. I haven't even talked about it uh, with them, and I will not talk about it yeah. with them, because I feel it's inappropriate and it's, yeah. it's really difficult for them. I mean, I they understand. would be a competitor to their own client base. I understand. I, I think it would be unwise to do that, but who knows? So, I mean, we're, we're doing it on our own, and we've got to start somewhere. So let's start by the crypto license. At least it will allow us to continue our business from the Netherlands to Europe, and then... Um, so after that, uh, we will look at the back, actual yeah, license. I'm not saying, like, every crypto has this issue. You know, the, the technology and the crypto starts smelling and looking like a bank. Yeah. Everyone has an issue in terms yeah. of the regulatory environment. So the banking license is next? Yeah, can I ask a question? Yeah. yeah. No, 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 no. And yeah. I'm already talking to uh, some of the people. It will probably be this way now. This way now. Regarding the licensing, because uh, you're talking about a payment license, but uh, I used to work with banking here a lot. I think you only need a payment license. No, we actually want to. I mean, if you're if you're doing it anyway, you want to make sure that you're doing it for the for for you get to operate in the long run as well. And I want to do something else. If if we if we are doing this, I want to be able to uh, allow people to deposit their fiat, keep it as a bank issue fiat on ledger, spend it as a bank issue fiat. Maybe payments receipts, and my name is Susan. I want to uh, keep your money safe on the deposit guarantee scheme. Yeah, it makes sense. Yeah. yeah. I want, I mean, people need to trust this, and to gain their trust, it's really important to not be like an EMI. Uh, You're you operating want, like a bank. You want to keep your money safe, and you want them to trust you enough to actually keep your money. So I think it's going to be an actual bank. Yeah. yeah, awesome. Absolutely. So, that's it. Anyone with other questions before I go back to my chair? So guys, uh, thanks for watching. Sorry for the poor quality at the end, but the second camera that I set up suddenly stopped working. So I had to use the Periscope footage, and that has been gone through. That went through internet and you know scrambled all up. So sorry about that. Next time I'll see if I can get a second cameraman to assist me. Um, if there's uh, anything else that you would like uh, to know, see, or want me to do different the next time, please let us know. Um, and on that bombshell, bye.